from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. Hi, welcome to Community Hotline. My name is Monica Weitzel and we're here at Metro East Community Media in Gresham, Oregon. Tonight I have with me the President and CEO of the Urban League of Portland, Michael Alexander. Thanks for being here, Michael. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks. It's, um, you haven't been out here before and I, I'm really glad to have you here. And, and not only are you representing the Urban League of Portland, but I understand you're actually going to be extending services out to East County a little more too. That's correct. That's right. That's correct. Before I get into that then, could you tell me a little bit, for those who maybe aren't familiar with the Urban League, what, um, a little bit about the history and maybe what your mission is. All right. Well, the mission of the Urban League is to enable African Americans and others to secure economic self-reliance, parity, power, and civil rights. We are a civil rights organization who came into operation here in 1945. Oh, that's a long time ago. It is. It's, I think we're entering our 68th year. Uh, we are one of approximately 95 affiliates of the National Urban League, which is based in New York City, and which was founded in 1910. And it's one of the two oldest civil rights organizations mm -hmm. in the country. Uh, Portland. Uh, created its affiliate shortly uh, after the beginning of World War II when the city saw a significant increase in the number of African American residents largely to support the shipping industry. Right, the shipyards. Yep. So we uh, have been in place since then and have worked to try to advance the issues that are of concern to the African American community and also of communities of color around the state. Okay. And, and everything has changed from 1945 to now, but some things still remain the same, yeah. obviously. Yeah. I know that um, you said the shipyards, uh, uh, the African Americans coming to work in the shipyards. There were certain parts of Portland that were predominantly the black neighborhoods, um, I know the Albina area yes. and, and other areas. But um, how, has that, how has that changed since then? Well, you know, it's interesting if uh, you trace the history of African Americans in, uh, in the Portland and the Portland metropolitan area, when those workers were originally located here to support the shipping industry, many of them lived in an area called Vanport, which was based between Vancouver and Portland. And right. it was a community, uh, not exclusively African Americans, but largely of workers who were housed there to support some of the heavy industry. Uh, 1948, there was a catastrophic flood. The Vanport flood. Exactly. Yes. I think that many folks know caused the displacement of all of those residents. And the vast majority of African Americans were relocated to areas within North and Northeast Portland, mm -hmm. the traditional Albina district. Right. Um, you know, I'd like to say that that was a very progressive decision, but the reality is that it was an area that was targeted for African Americans to live in. There were restrictions within the city as to where African Americans could own property wow. or buy or live. Uh, the redlining really circled that district. And so many of those folks um, were dislocated to the Albina district, the Elliott neighborhoods, and others. Uh, but as African Americans have done in many cities where they faced housing discrimination and other challenges, they took that community and made it a vibrant community. Yes. A yes, vibrant so community. Yeah. Businesses, um, restaurants, faith communities, entertainment districts. And if you look at the history of the Albina District and the Elliott neighborhood, Boise neighborhood, and others, it was a vibrant, vibrant community. Sure. So, how has the Urban League? assisted in with those communities. I know you, your civil rights and your um, you know, help, helping these people um, attain financial stability, but how do you go about doing that? What, what are the actual concrete, tangible things that you do for African Americans and other people of color? Where our focus is now are really in four areas. And I think the things that we do have evolved over the 67 years we've been here based on what's been needed sure. by our community. Uh, you know, we're not, if you think about it, we preceded the civil rights era. So there were yeah, issues yeah. of um, 
you know, Portland and the state of Oregon uh, were not places where theoretically African Americans could own property. Um, it, within our state constitution, there were restrictions on where you could live, who you could marry. Even then? Even then, even then. So when you begin to look at some of the legal challenges, um, it took many, many years of pressing and promoting and uh, advocating for change, even within the state constitution. Um, so by advocating, you're talking about you actually go to Go change laws around public, around public accommodations, you know, and I think in those days you saw a real focus on making things that were prohibited um, legal and having mm -hmm. that happen through the legislative process. Um, just the fair accommodations law that, mm -hmm. you know, required uh, African Americans to be able to own homes wherever they want to, wherever they could afford to, uh, public accommodations and hotels and restaurants. Uh, those things took mm -hmm law. The it's amazing. Law. That's amazing. You know, really, if you think about it, because that isn't that long ago. No, I, as I tell people, it's within my lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've been in Portland for just over seven years and um, just uh, love the city. Uh, I've lived in eight cities and this is my eighth and, and I really have taken a very deep and abiding liking to Portland. But I also know that the history here for somebody who grew up is very different, mm -hmm. that they've seen lots of changes. And I think some of the changes for the good, but it doesn't erase the history. Right, uh, right. And I think There's some ugly of, history there. There is, there is. There is. Uh, but there's also, um, as I said, a very strong resilience and capability on the part of not only African Americans, but people who are concerned about equity and equality mm -hmm. being afforded to everyone who lives here, yeah. to continue to try to drive some of those changes. Today, we focus on programs for senior citizens, uh, getting uh, young children enrolled in the Oregon Health Plan under the Healthy Kids Act. We do a significant amount of advocacy. Uh, so those most, are the most vulnerable yes, populations right there. Yes. And uh, recently, we're very successful in having a uh, cultural competency bill passed by the Oregon House this, this past week that would require health care providers to undergo training and continuing education training to better understand the populations that they would serve. Oh, okay. Um, I saw something about that cultural competency, but I didn't yeah. understand what it actually entailed. So you took that to, you took that to Salem, and it was, was that the one that there was a, there was a whole group of people went down there to? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. We actually had a legislative action day uh, in February where we took over 300 yeah, members that's, of that's what the I community, remember seniors, that. yeah. toddlers, uh, high school students, working folks, down to, uh, to meet with uh, our elected officials. That's and powerful. to share with them that's those things that were going to be important yeah. to us and important to our community, and I think important to the city as a whole. Mm -hmm. Uh, and being able to muster that type of support and work with a number of coalition partners around issues of common concern right. has been a real part of our focus. How was the reception for you there? You know, I think the reception was a very open one. Yeah. Um, a number of our, what, what I would call the, the friends of the issues that mm -hmm. we believe are important, we're very happy to see us. Um, we also had the opportunity to educate people who may not have as deep an understanding of what was important to us and why. Right. Uh, right. And I think to be able to have that type of dialogue and to do it in a very genuine and authentic way yeah. um, helps people to make good decisions in the absence of information. I agree. You know, and I think so much is so much of people's misunderstandings are just based on pure ignorance. You know, and. and because Portland and Oregon, it's a pretty white state. Really. Yeah, it is. You know, there's, it's not a huge African American uh, population here. And I think if people haven't been exposed to that, I grew up in Milwaukee, Oregon. I didn't know any black people until I was an adult and moved into Portland, you know, growing up. And so it was, you know, um, that's just a weird thing in a lot of parts of the country. You would not expect that. And, and so not understanding some of the issues that people of a different color have to, you know, go through. It's it's kind of understandable, but yes, you have to you have to educate, and uh, and the lobbying is, is important. You talk about the seniors. What kind of things are you doing for seniors? Well, you know, we have a senior uh, day program, which is located in North Portland uh, at the Martin Luther King Center, right on Killingsworth. Mm -hmm. And uh, our focus is to provide socialization and outlets and. Um, 
engagement type of activities for our seniors. So like most social, social activities? Yeah, and, in addition to case management, we oh, okay. provide some training and program around um, sort of care for people who are diabetic or mm. suffering from hypertension. What are the types of things that you need to do to manage that illness, oh, particularly as you get older? We also provide transportation services oh. um, to your doctors, to pick up pharmacy, shopping. Uh, things to help to limit the social isolation right. that many of our seniors uh, go through as you get older and as family spreads around or moves away. Right. Um, it becomes a part of that social support system. Michael, do you, do you partner with other organizations in the city to provide those kind of services? or is Well, we do. Our senior programs are done in partnership with the Hollywood Senior Services Center. Um, we do a lot of collaboration, um, particularly with our Healthy Kids program and going out to places where we can identify families and individuals mm -hmm. who we can help to get enrolled in, in the coverages that the state affords. And I think overall, um, we look to find coalitions uh, to work with around issues where we would both like to see change. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, these are not issues that are unique to African Americans. Right, right, a lot of those, I, the seniors and the kids, those issues pretty much pretty much universal, I think. But yeah. there are some maybe, diabetes, for example, is, is much higher. Higher prevalence, and clearly when we look at healthcare disparities mm -hmm. and some of the work that we need to do around policy, it's because there are unique markers that are characteristic right. of African-American populations, right. much more so than others. Yeah. Uh, but they still are things that need to be addressed. Yeah, of course. What about you personally? You're, the, you're a relatively new CEO and president of the Urban League. Do you have anything that's especially important to you personally that you want to that you want to work for? Well, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate in that I come into an organization that has worked very hard to address concerns of this community. But there are some areas that I think we all agree we want to see our focus increased uh, in the area of employment and job readiness training. Um, it's critical. Uh, as we continue to emerge from this economic recession, one of the great concerns that many of us have, and I certainly hold, is that we will see overall improvement in employment rates across the state, but stagnation for many communities of color. Mm -hmm. You know, we are looking at an 18% unemployment rate within the African American community wow. as the state of Oregon is dipping down below 8%. Um, you know, we had significantly higher unemployment rates before the recession. Right. And our hope is that as we find ourselves coming out of it, we don't go back to that same situation. Right. We'd, rather, um, we'd rather be moving forward. Than yeah, well, hopefully the high tide yeah. will lift all yeah. ships. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's the belief. That's but in many communities, and in not just Portland and not just Oregon, when we see these disparities, um, the larger population can get very comfortable in accepting them. And our focus is to make sure that as there are opportunities for improvement, that everyone is on the bus. So how, how do you do that? I mean, obviously, Working with the schools is important and getting kids educated and keeping the kids in the schools. But what about when you're an adult and you're out of school? Do you see the problem more as, um, as with employers not hiring people of color? Do you see it as um, a problem with the way people are, are presenting themselves? I don't, where, where does that disparity come from? How do you see that? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my job or my role is, is a very personal one. And so I think the path that I choose to pursue in terms of employment or profession uh, is not something that is going to be strongly influenced by others. What will be strongly influenced by others is the ability to be fairly assessed and evaluated for those opportunities. And that is what we're trying to raise visibility and awareness about. I think it's also important for us to understand that if we see disparities, the way to address that is to have strategies that are targeted towards mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's, you know, it's no way to address something without acknowledging, one, that it exists, two, that it falls outside of what is acceptable, and then three, to begin to target it. We can look at populations, communities, zip codes that have higher percentages of unemployment and begin to target strategies to address that. Is it issues related to transportation? Is it issues related to training opportunities? Are some of the largest purchasers of construction projects or major um, you know, housing renovation programs or buildings, are they setting standards for what they want to see by way of minority subcontractors' mm -hmm. involvement? 
are we looking at that as an opportunity to also say, okay, let's identify training opportunities to begin to bring younger people into the workforce? Is this a way to do that? The city, I think, has done a good job of acknowledging the need to approach challenges or problems with an equity lens that we not only want to fix, we want to fix that will address the current need, but also historical disparities that may have existed mm -hmm. as well. How do we do both? Wow. And I think as you continue to look at not only the solution, but an equitable solution, it takes you into a different dimension. And I think that's a part of the challenge that we have. How do we find those things that rectify the way things have always been? because looking at them in the light of how they've always been and hoping that they change independent <laughs> of some type of a unique uh, intervention or strategy is the definition for insanity. Right, <laughs> I agree. You must do an awful lot of research through the Urban League or, or avail yourselves of a lot of research to, to try to look at, you know, look at our community and try to figure out where those problems lie. We, we've done a tremendous amount of research. In 2009, the, the Urban League commissioned and published the State of Black Oregon, in which we looked at the status of African Americans across the state through multiple lenses and multiple dimensions. Wow. Healthcare, employment, education, uh, public safety, uh, violence. It must domestic. almost be like a Bible for you to work off of, you know, to and I mean, it's, it's a wonderful document yeah. for others within the areas they begin to look at, you know, in, in order to move, you have to measure. And it was a data-driven analysis with uh, recommendations, both from a policy and a programmatic perspective, that anyone, not just someone within the black community, anyone who was looking to rectify some of these disparate indicators and markers could use as a source of information to begin to build some strategies around. And it's a source point for us as well. How does somebody avail themselves of that information? Well, Where is that available? The libraries? It's it available library? on the uh, on what? the website. If yeah, you go okay. to ulpdx.org, okay. www.ulpdx.org, the Urban League site, there's a link to the okay. uh, state of Black Oregon. Um, Google searches will identify it okay. as well. I think even if you ask some questions like, you know, what is the unemployment for African Americans in the state of Oregon? It will direct you to the state. That's a great resource. Because it is the primary resource yeah. for that type right. of information. You, um, the Urban League is going to be sponsoring a, a job fair soon, which hopefully will encourage people to get out there and get some more jobs, um, you know, to help fill some of those those openings. What can you tell me about that? That's coming well, up fairly soon. It is coming up on the 22nd of April, okay. and it will be at the uh, Double Tree Hotel in, in uh, Lloyd Center. And uh, we're very fortunate in that we have over 35 employers who will be presenting that day on job opportunities and their organizations and things that will help underemployed or unemployed individuals look to see what potential there would be for finding a role with these organizations. But I think it's also a venue for people who are in the workforce who are looking to see whether there are, you know, crossover opportunities that they may want to pursue within their career. I think there's a lot more organizations that are finally realizing that's important. Well, and mm -hmm. I also think as we begin to come out of this economic uh, recession that, that we've been through, there will be a need for skilled labor, mm -hmm. there will be a need for knowledge workers, mm -hmm. there will be a need to create very diverse workforces that are reflective of the city right. that we're in. Right. Uh, and I think for us, it's always been a way of sort of bringing need and opportunity together uh, because this is sort of an annual event for us. And it's very important and it allows many of the organizations and partners who we work with around employment issues to sort of come together and it allows us to bring our community to those individuals. Right. Well, do you, can you name me a couple of organizations that are going to be there or companies that are going oh, to be there? OSHU, PGE, Bonneville. Okay, some, uh, some big I, players. I, it, yeah. Major plays, New yeah. Seasons, and now I have okay. to go through all yeah, of them. Yeah, yes, oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> TriMet, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Brooks Staffing, okay. which is a, yeah. a, a local, a, staffing, local organization. Yes. Uh, Metro will be there. The uh, IBEW, as well as the, uh, the, workers, the yeah. Pacific uh, Northwest uh, Pacific Carpenters Union, who are one of our partners, um, Roofers Union as well, uh, the United Way, LifeWorks, City of Beaverton, uh, uh, Portland State University, PDC. Okay. Uh, so some great, great 
Yeah. There could be some good jobs Regents out Blue there. Cross will be serving as one of our sponsors along with Oregon, uh, with ODOT and uh, the Carpenters Union. And our primary sponsor is the um, Clear Channel Media and Entertainment. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. So it, it, we're very fortunate to have a strong group yeah, of that sound, uh, partners. It sounds like a great lineup. And, and there are other things that are offered at the job fair as well. I was reading something about you can have your, a photo taken for your, you know, for, for your, your uh, if you social media, exactly, you know, that exactly. kind of thing. Yeah, that's uh, great. Little, there's, little there's perks. A, there's a whole, <laughs> little perks. a whole new dimension around social oh media gosh. that uh, yeah, it's hard sure to keep is. up with. It's just it's, its own work. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's just ever evolving and expanding. We're just about out of time, Michael. What um, what else do we need to know about the Urban League that would, should be important for for? Well, you know, I could I could talk about the Urban League for forever, but there are a couple of things that, that I would say. You know, one is that um, this is a city that uh, looks to be very progressive, and uh, I think tries to do some of the right things. Being able to advance the work of the Urban League and other groups who are targeted in representing communities of color, I think is is uh, is is important, very important. It's the reason that I feel so privileged to be able to serve in the role that I serve in. Um, I would also say that I would encourage folks to take some time and, and go to our website. We have just done a significant reconstruction of our site and we'll continue to add content and, and uh, develop it, but we're very pleased with it. A lot of good um, stuff on there. I, I, I got into it a little bit today. And it yeah, was, there, there was. There so are, it was a good website. Are. Yeah. And and I also think that it comes at a time when the city is going to make significant decisions around how we support people within all of the city of Portland and East County. And for us, it comes at a time when we understand that it's critical for us to extend our program footprint to serve many of the folks who are now resident in East County who historically would have been in North and Northeast Portland. Right, so, and you have expanded those services to East County, especially for seniors. Particularly for our seniors. And uh, our hope is to be able to bring the same sense of what community feels like to some of the folks who have been displaced through a lot of different forces. And maybe um, feel a little bit lost out here because they don't, they're not, they don't have that sense of community that perhaps they had. Yes, yes. So if, if folks are interested in learning about the East County services, can that also be found on the Urban League yes. PDX website? Absolutely, or pick up the phone and give us a call. Okay. And we have somebody, we have a senior case manager who is dedicated to that and she spends her time in East County five right. days a week and she's looking to find those folks who we can support. Good. Good. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate you coming out here today to let us know what's going on with the Urban League, and I think they have a great asset in you as a president and CEO there. If you're interested in finding out more about the Urban League of Portland or East County, be sure to go to their website or give them a call, as, as Michael Alexander suggested. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about the job fair coming up, we'll have the information on the screen, and be sure to check it out. I'm Monica Weitzel. Thanks for watching Community Hotline. We'll see you here next week.